Hello everyone and thanks for joining the latest Onto Text webinar. My name is Yasen Stoikov and I will be the host of this session. Today we are going to talk about GraphDB latest major release, namely GraphDB 10, and there is no better person to speak about this than Pavel Mikhailov, who is the GraphDB owner. So uh, Pavel, I'm very glad that you are here. Uh, before I give you the floor, uh, I would quickly introduce you with a few words and then uh, go over a few housekeeping details that are important. So um, the introduction, Pavel Mikhailov is the master chef in the GraphDB kitchen and makes sure we deliver an excellent product that meets our client ex expectations. As the product owner of GraphDB, he focuses both on the grand vision and the detail and engages with stakeholders at multiple levels. Before, Pavel was GraphDB architect and team lead who translated business tech requirements and defined architectural approaches and guided the team on all technical matters. Um, with this short introduction, I will quickly go over the housekeeping now. Uh, so, as always, all attendees are currently on mute, and this is to avoid background noises and also to enable the speaker to present without any interruptions. However, you can still communicate with us using the chat box and the question box in your GoToWebinar panel, and we actually strongly encourage you to do that. Ask any question at any given time, because at the end of this webinar, we have planned a short Q&A session in which we will try to address all of the questions, and of course, we hope that we will, ha we will be able to have a meaningful discussion then. Um, as always, the session is also being recorded, and this link to the recording will be available to you, so you will have it. Most probably, it will be distributed tomorrow, uh, alongside any queries and other stuff that Pavel will um, discuss now. So with that out of the way, Pavka, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yasin. So hi, everyone. Uh, as you already heard, my name is Pavel, and I'm the product owner of GraphDB. And today we are going to talk about GraphDB 10 and how it makes it easy for you to use GraphDB 10, no matter how small or how big your company is, and how easy it is to uh, switch from one edition to another GraphDB edition to always um, meet your needs as a customer. So one of the big changes in GraphDB 10 compared to previous editions is that uh, GraphDB now is a single distribution. There is only um, one GraphDB to download. Before that, we used to have three different downloads, one for GraphDB free, another one for GraphDB standard edition, and the third one for GraphDB enterprise edition, which meant that, uh, say, if you're now using GraphDB standard, and if you wanted to switch to GraphDB Enterprise at some point, you'd have to download new software, install it again, and then there was uh, a bit of a complicated procedure to transfer your data from um, one GraphDB to the other GraphDB. With GraphDB 10, it's a breeze to just uh, install it once and then um, upgrade as necessary without even restarting the database. And I want to point out that as part of it being a single distribution, uh, now the documentation for GraphDB 10 is also um, a single single point of documentation. So if you just click here on the documentation, uh, it opens the documentation for GraphDB 10, and there is no other documentation for GraphDB 10 besides this one. So um, imagine now that you're a small company and you decided to uh, give GraphDB free a go. So this is just one uh, installation of GraphDB free that I have running here. You can see that it's GraphDB free because of the license, which is currently GraphDB free. And in order to do anything in GraphDB, just like previous versions, you have to create a repository and this is the moment to point out that as part of the change to a single distribution, we also changed the way repositories are configured. Before the change, we used to have four different kinds of GraphDB repositories, uh, GraphDB free, GraphDB standard, and 
for GraphDB Enterprise, we used to have um, the GraphDB Worker and the GraphDB Master Repository. Now it's just a single GraphDB repository type, no matter what uh, edition you're using. So I'm just going to create um, a repository, call it demo1. And now I'm just going to import some data into this repository. So there are many different ways you can import data in GraphDB. I'm not going to cover this because it's uh, more or less the same as previous versions. So uh, the way I'm going to use is um, I have some files uploaded on the server. So uh, I'm going to import uh, the wine and food databases. It's just two very popular ontologies that contain uh, information on wine and food. And so I import this. I can go to the Sparkle editor and do a select. And as you can see, I have back some data. And if you click on something, uh, it will open the Resource Explorer, which shows you the data in table form. But looking at tables is not so exciting. So uh, what you might want to do is to uh, go to the visual graph so that you can explore the data in a much more intuitive way. And if we click around, we can um, browse the graph and see that uh, cake and cheese are both consumable things and they are both desserts and they are both edible things. So cheese is usually not the first thing up when you say dessert, but very often it's combined with wine and served as a dessert. So let's move on to the next topic, uh, which is the improvements we made in the GraphDB connectors. So I'm going to create another repository just to keep my data separate. And I'm going to call this repository demo2. And switch to that repository. And <clears throat> again, I'm going to import the server file that I prepared beforehand. And before I import the file, let's uh, look at this file and see what it contains. It's actually, let me just try to make it slightly bigger so that you can see it easier. It contains some um, RDF data about employees and we have different employees. Each employee has an email, a name of course, and one or more roles assigned. So if we look here at, um, say, Nancy Scott, we see that she has two roles, row one and row two. And if we uh, look at the actual roles, we see that different roles started at a given point in time. <clears throat> they might have ended at a given point in time and they might have been replaced by another or with the company. And this usually happens when someone gets promoted and in this case Nancy Scott uh, was employed as a software developer at some point she was promoted to a senior software developer and of course if people leave then uh, you get deleted dates without it being replaced by another role <clears throat> then just like in most companies now and then uh, they do assessments and if we again just look around the file and we see that uh, Nancy Scott has an assessment uh, on a given date and the assessment just says that uh, Nancy Scott was the employee. Uh, she scored 115 uh, on the assessment and it was done on 11th of January 2022. So we're going to use this data to create uh, two kinds of connectors. So let's first import the data. And the first kind of connector I'm going to create is just a very simple one using the Lucene connector, which is the one that is available in GraphDB free. While um, GraphDB Enterprise offers more choice, which we're going to see later. <clears throat> 
So in this connector, we just define um, a couple of fields, the name of the employee, the email of the employee, and the role of the employee. And as you remember from the data, the turtle serialization of the data that we looked at, uh, roles can start and end at a given time. And in this particular um, Lucene connector, we want to index employees that are currently employed and we want the role field to point at their current role. It's very easy to achieve that by simply filtering um, the value for the role field such that um, the role doesn't have a deleted um, triple associated. So if we look at the property chain that leads to this field, we start from the employee, we go to the role, and then we go to the position. So in case of Nancy that we looked at earlier, uh, here will be Nancy, then at this point it will be Nancy's row one or row two, and in this position it will be Nancy's um, software developer or senior software developer, depending on the role. And her first role will have a um, um, DCT deleted triple, while her second role wouldn't have that. And so if we filter saying that we want the parent of at this point, so the parent of this, which means this is here, this is the software developer, and we go to the parent and to reach the point where it's the role. So Nancy's role one. And then we go another hop from there and look at um, triples that start from row one and go to the deleted predicate. And we want this whole thing to be unbound, so we don't want to have a triple there. <clears throat> and this was possible before uh, in GraphDB9, but the filters in GraphDB9 were defined uh, for the whole uh, connector instance and not per field. And it was very confusing because those filters could filter both individual values of individual fields as well as uh, entire documents. We decided to split those into several kinds of individual filter types that allow you um, to understand better what's going on. So in this case, this filter applies only to the row field and doesn't do anything on the other fields. And it's called the value filter because it filters out values. And so if we try to create this connector, it gets created. And now we might want to um, use this connector to perform a query. And this is a very basic example of how you um, issue a query using a GraphDB connector. So um, we want to find all the employees that have the role team lead uh, at the moment. So if they had team lead in the past, we wouldn't get them or that's what we hope for. And so if we run this, uh, we get seven employees that are currently uh, employed as team lead. And if you're actually curious, we can go back to the data and see if there was a team lead that stopped being a team lead at some point. And here we have Brian, Brian L. Brown, who used to be employed as a team lead at some point, and then he transitioned to another role as a software architect. And if we look back at the results, Brian isn't here because his current position isn't a team lead. And so all of this is possible just by using GraphDB free, so it's free to use. And at some point, if your needs at the company grow, you might want to um, index additional things. So for example, uh, if you want to index all the assessments uh, in a connector in order to um, perform different kinds of searches and aggregations on them, you might want to look at the Elasticsearch connector just because it's not possible to do those things with the Lucene connector. And I'm going to copy another connector definition. So what this connector definition does, it indexes assessments. So for each employee, um, an assessment might have happened at some point. And if we quickly go back to the data and look at assessments, remember that assessments um, are associated with the employee 
who was assessed. Uh, each uh, assessment has a score and each assessment has a date. And what you want to index in the connector is the assessment and the particular roles that the given employee that was assessed had at that point in time when the assessment was performed. So this is possible because of um, some new features in the connectors that weren't there before. And those features have to do with uh, comparing the value of one field to the value of another field. So in this case, we define um, a nested field, which is a feature of the Elasticsearch connector, but not of the Lucene one, just because Elasticsearch has nested fields. And so we want to index the assessments. And for each assessment, we map the roles of that employee. And we filter them such using the document filter inside the, desk, inside the nested document that um, the role created of the role has to be before the assessment date and the role deleted of the role has to be after the assessment date or the role deleted uh, date must be uh, empty, which means the position is still uh, ongoing. And so if I try to create this connector, uh, I get an error just because my license is currently GraphDB free. So at this point, I uh, need to upgrade to GraphDB free. Say I uh, contacted OntoTex, got an evaluation license. And evaluation licenses are provided both in uh, as a binary file and in pasteable form. So this is my license here, and I can quickly uh, change the license of the running GraphDB by going to setup, and then um, license. And clicking this button here, I can either upload the binary file or I can paste the pasteable license. So I'm going to do that. Uh, it parses the license, validates it, asks me for asks me for confirmation and that's the license that uh, I really wanted. So I'm sure I click yes. And now I can go back to my Sparkle editor and retry doing the same thing. And now it succeeds because uh, if we quickly go back to the home screen, we can check that the license is now GraphDB Enterprise Edition. So um, I just upgraded to GraphDB uh, Enterprise without even restarting GraphDB and without installing anything else. Uh, before that, in GraphDB 9, I would have to uh, install a different piece of software, create my repository again, and then import my data again before I could uh, continue using the upgraded GraphDB, so the upgraded edition. And I've just created this connector, and so we might want to have a look at what's in the Elasticsearch. Unlike Lucene, which is just stored on the disk, it's very easy to just look at um, documents in Elasticsearch because it's a third-party service. So um, this way, I just performed um, a search directly to Elasticsearch without saying anything about the search, which means that I get all the documents that are stored. And I see that um, obviously I've indexed assessments because that's what I wanted. And for each assessment, uh, I have the employee that was assessed. I have the assessment score of the assessment and I have the roles that this particular employee had uh, at the date the assessment was performed. So, um, the more typical way to um, use such a connector is by using it through GraphDB. So I have here another Sparkle query that uses um, a connector query inside Sparkle. So this time I'm using the new um, connector instance that I created in Elasticsearch. And this big JSON bit here is a, an Elasticsearch raw query. So the 
there are two ways to create Elasticsearch. One is just to uh, enter very short queries, which you can do a lot of full text searches like that. But if you want something more complex, you have to write it uh, in the Elasticsearch uh, query language. And in this particular query, I want to find all the roles that um, all the assessments that have the team lead position or the team lead, the team lead role at uh, the point of the assessment, as well as having uh, an assessment score greater than 100. And so from the connector, I'll be getting back the assessment and through the assessment, I can get um, Uh, to the employee uh, as well as get the score. So if I run this, I get back uh, five results. Uh, it's um, just some people and we see that for, uh, for example, for um, someone called Marilyn Diaz, we got two assessments and she scored uh, 103 and 118 on the other one. And we can also try, um, if you're curious about Marilyn Diaz, we can have a look here. And see the roles. So she was a senior software developer. So that's when she was assessed the first time. And then at some point she was promoted uh, to a team lead. So far, so good. You have your connectors um, in GraphDB Enterprise, and you still have the the Lucene connector that I created earlier. It's still usable, so uh, we can check that if we go back here. And this is the the query that uh, access the Lucene connector. So if we execute it again, we it still works. So just the, the fact that we upgraded to um, the Enterprise Edition doesn't change anything of the things that were already there and they were working. <clears throat> um, one particular note here about the connectors is that uh, those new filter changes, so the the possibility to use uh, two filter variables as well as uh, the split of the different kinds of filters into different definitions that have to be defined uh, at the appropriate level means that uh, connector instances that were created in GraphDB 9 are no longer compatible with uh, GraphDB 10, so you have to um, rewrite the definition a bit. But for the most part, uh, it's very easy to do that. So if we go back to the documentation, so just to remind you, if you're wondering how to access the documentation, uh, the easiest way is to uh, use the workbench. And if you go to help documentation, it will open the, the right URL for this particular version of GraphDB. And if we look at, um, migrating GraphDB configurations and the changes here for the connectors. So let's say we used to have uh, Elasticsearch connectors in the previous version and we want to upgrade, so we follow this link. And it's pretty much straightforward. Um, you take your single connector definition uh, in GraphDB 9 and you look at the individual things. And uh, one way to do this is to uh, look at things and uh, try to figure out what you meant when you wrote the original filter. And if the idea was to remove individual values, um, then you have to use a per field value filter. So um, the per field value filter is what I used in my first connector definition here in order to limit the kinds of values that I have in this particular field. And if the idea was to remove entire documents, then you have to define a document filter um, in the utmost level. 
And if you're really not sure what you meant when you did this, uh, another way to look at um, the rewrite is if it's not bound, then it's a per field value filter. And if it's bound, it's a top level document filter. And here is an example of uh, how this uh, might be rewritten. So it's not really that difficult. And if you need uh, help, you can always um, write to the GraphDB support and we'll help you. So let's move on to the the thing I call the crown jewel of GraphDB 10. It's the new GraphDB uh, 10 cluster, which is uh, pretty much something that we wrote from scratch. We just um, scrapped the previous cluster that we used to have up to GraphDB 9, and we created an entirely new cluster based on the raft consensus um, algorithm. Why we did that is because the previous architecture uh, proved not to be so robust because it had some weak points. For example, um, it needed different kinds of um, nodes in the cluster. And there were the worker nodes that contained the copy of the data and there were the master nodes that were used only to access the cluster. And so masters were the weak point. And if a master failed, um, what you could do is you could have uh, a topology that had more than one master, but um, in order to switch from to the other master, you had to do some human intervention uh, for the switch. While uh, with the raft consensus algorithm, we ditched um, the masters. And so now you can think of the new cluster as having only workers, but they're not actually workers. But uh, they're like workers because uh, each of them contains a copy of the data and each of them can take over and start uh, managing the cluster. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that. So uh, in order to have a cluster, you need obviously more than one GraphDB installation. Um, I've already run four other GraphDBs. So I'm just going to... Um, so to keep you um, to keep things going, uh, this is still the same company that started with GraphDB free. Then it upgraded to Enterprise because you needed the Elasticsearch connector, and now the needs of that company are going again. So they want um, high availability. That's why uh, they decided to try the GraphDB cluster. So they've uh, started four more GraphDBs because they want to have a cluster of based of uh, created with five nodes and so to create a cluster uh, you can go to setup cluster and the instance that you are using to create the cluster always needs to be inside the cluster that's why it's already here and now we just need to add the other graph dbs So the five GraphDBs, the one I'm using now is GraphDB1example.com and then GraphDB2 and so on up to five. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm actually adding remote locations that will also appear in the, I'll show you in a bit after I create the cluster way where they appear as well. So now i've added the remote locations that i want to use to create the cluster and i have to choose which of those locations i want so i will click on all of them which means that i'm going to have a cluster of five nodes so now i can either click the create button or i can click here on advanced options and maybe change some of these but the defaults should be good for most um, for most scenarios so the first time you do this don't bother changing those and when you click the create button it will create the cluster and the five nodes of the cluster will appear and in the cluster 
each of the nodes have a particular state at any given point. They all start as followers because in the raft consensus algorithm, that's how things work. So they start as followers. That's the ear icon with the dark blue background. At some point, one of the nodes will decide uh, because there is no leader currently um, elected. So the orange one is the leader and this is the one who controls what happens in the cluster. And if there is no leader, uh, one of the nodes initiates election and uh, all of the nodes vote. And if the election is successful, um, this particular node becomes the current leader. So in this case, uh, I'm still on graphdb1 example.com and the leader that was elected is graphdb3. And the lines between the nodes from the leader to the followers, uh, so a green solid line means that uh, the nodes are in sync. And if it's any other kind of line, it means that uh, it's either out of sync or syncing at the moment. So that's pretty much everything I had to do to create the cluster. Um, I can look at the cluster configuration. So those, those are the values that were in the advanced uh, dialog when I created the cluster. And this is just a list of the, of the nodes uh, as well as uh, the status of each node. And so now I can just continue using this GraphDB1 uh, as, I, um, as I was using it before creating the cluster. So if I uh, go back to the Sparkle editor and um, I run a select, it, it works. I can, for example, um, maybe try adding some data. And I've just added some data. And which means that uh, if we quickly go back to the cluster, and GraphDB3 is the leader and normally uh, when using the Raft protocol you have to uh, send all the rights to the leader but uh, with GraphDB10 we made it such a way that it doesn't matter if you're using the leader or using any of the of the followers when you um, do rights. So any of these five GraphDBs you can use. So let's for example open GraphDB5. And it's important to know that when GraphDB5 was uh, was started, there were no repositories in it. And once it was uh, made part of the cluster, the repositories of the node that was used to create the cluster were replicated to all the other nodes. So now if I uh, click here on demo one, that's the repository I used to load the food and wine ontologies. I can just try executing a Sparkle query and I get the results. I can try again opening the visual graph. So this time it's the non-consumable thing and not the consumable one. So any of these five graph DBs can be um, used pretty much as if it was a single graph DB, but they are in a cluster. So Let's see what happens if I create now a third repository. So now I'm on GraphDB5, just to remind you, and the current leader is GraphDB3. And so I can create a third repo called uh, uh, Demo3. And I can switch to that repo and maybe I can add some statements here. And now if we go back to um, to GraphDB1, we should have uh, Demo3, which is the repo I created on GraphDB5. And because all of this is in a cluster, it, it was automatically replicated to um, the other GraphDBs. And so if I now try to... Um, select the data in demo tree. I get the data that I inserted on, on the other graph DB. So it doesn't matter if um, which graph DB you use at any given moment. Um, 
Uh, okay. So you saw how easy, easy it is to um, start, say, from GraphDB3, um, use it until it uh, stops meeting your needs, and then upgrade to the Enterprise Edition simply by changing the license without restarting the database. And then uh, if at some point you need a highly available system that consists of several nodes, uh, you can very easily upgrade this to a cluster environment, again, without installing anything and without even restarting the database. Uh, so let's talk a bit more about the cluster. It's important to note that um, you need to have, well, you don't need to, but it's a good idea to have a, an odd number of nodes, simply because the raft consensus um, algorithm is based on majority voting. And so when you have five nodes, they can never split in such a way that uh, the two sides will be uh, the same number. So it could be three to two, uh, but never say if this was a cluster of um, six nodes, they can easily split uh, in two parts. So three of the nodes see each, each of those three nodes and three other nodes see each of those three other nodes and then that's why it's recommended to always have an odd number of nodes. And as a minimum, that means three, then five is a good number and seven is a good number as well. So um, you can also read a bit more on how the cluster works in the documentation. Uh, if you go there and then general cluster basics, uh, it's you can read how the raft consensus algorithm works, uh, how the log is replicated, uh, how the leader election happens, and, and so on. And the documentation is also the entry point of uh, creating a cluster and migrating from um, previous editions. So if, say, you want to migrate from a cluster in in a previous GraphDB edition, it's, I wouldn't call it straightforward, just because it's not something that you, that you click a button and it works. You have to do some work in order to do it. But the instructions should be uh, very clear. And if at any point you run into any problems, you can always contact the GraphDB support. Uh, and, of course, if you want to, uh, if we quickly go to creating a cluster, uh, I showed you how you can create a cluster using the workbench. So that's just pointing and clicking. And of course, that's nice to have when you um, are learning about things and you don't, you're not really sure how to how it works. But at some point, you of course might want to uh, automate this. And so uh, one way to automate it is by using the, the REST API. So I'll show you uh, what it might look like. So uh, the very same cluster that I just created using the workbench can be created uh, by this simple curl. So you just post some JSON uh, to one of the cluster API endpoints. And the minimum information you have to provide is uh, all of the nodes that you want to um, be part of the cluster. And there are similar endpoints uh, that allow you to just um, add another node or remove a node or delete the cluster if that's what you need. Okay. And if you want to monitor the cluster, uh, there are two endpoints. So one of the endpoints um, 
shows you the the status of of a particular node so in this particular case i'm uh, sending a, to check the status of graphdb1 and for graphdb1 i get back just the status of that node uh, i can see that it's a follower but you can also check the status of the whole cluster as a group by uh, sending a curl to another endpoint and in this particular case you get the status for all the nodes so the followers uh, you see here the leader uh, you see that the leader he has additional status for the link that provides that is uh, to every follower and pretty much this json corresponds to um, what you can see in this visualization here so uh, that was pretty much uh, what i wanted to show you today and i'm going to look at the questions now um so one of the questions is um whether there will be um multi-architecture docker image for multi-architecture in the sense uh, of for example intel and arm-based uh, cpus so the new macbooks for example use um I myself upgraded recently to an M1 CPU. So uh, yes, we are going to explore that possibility because we believe that um, as long as there is Java for uh, the particular architecture, it should be uh, no issue to uh, create a Docker. And there is Java for M1 CPU, so it should be easy. Um, so uh, there is a question if the followers uh, are able to process write queries uh, and if that might lead to any uh, race conditions if um, uh, different uh, nodes receive uh, changes that might change the same resource so what actually happens when you when you're in the cluster mode and you're sending a write to a graph db that isn't the leader at the moment this GraphDB will know that it's not the leader and it will do um, <clears throat> internal proxying to the leader. So all the writes happen through the leader anyway. It just happens behind the scenes and you as a user don't see that. So um, there are all the race condition potential situations are handled inside the leader, just like um, if this was a, a single node outside of a cluster, all the writes are synchronized and processed uh, at the same entry points in order to avoid such race conditions. Um, this reminds me uh, that um, if you want to access GraphDB um, through um, through the REST API or through the RDF4J client, <clears throat> one of the ways to do this is just by um, using any of the GraphDBs that, uh, that's in the cluster. We have, remember, GraphDB1 to GraphDB5. But the um, disadvantage is that, say, you um, use GraphDB1 in your client, and at some point, GraphDB1 dies just because um, the machine um, crashed, um, the CPU blew or whatever which means that you have to change the URL in your software and uh, restart it. So uh, in order to avoid this situation, we have two solutions to the problem. One is to uh, simply use our own um, client API, which is just an extension of the RDF4J uh, HTTP repository. So if, say, uh, for example, in, in your code before you used something like like this in order to change to using the GraphDB client api you only have to um, change the way you get the repository everything else stays the same and um, the client API uh, can be initialized with one or more URLs for the cluster and it will use those as a as a fallback uh, but it will also find out um, the rest of the cluster members so in this particular case I have GraphDB1 and GraphDB2 here and remember I created uh, a repo called demo3 
so I'm going to use that and I say I want to use cluster and it will find out that there are GraphDB 3, 4 and 5 as well and always use the leader in order to process. So if I run this, I should be able to um, insert some data and then get back the data that I inserted. So the, my triple was uh, fact one uh, is a type of fact and it has a content of GraphDB rocks and the select returned what I just um, wrote in the cluster. So that's one of the ways that you can use to um, stay independent of a particular node failing. And then the other uh, possibility is to use our external proxy that needs to be configured and run separately from, um, from GraphDB. The proxy is very lightweight, so um, the chance of it failing are much lower than um, a database. So, because the proxy doesn't have state, so nothing changes, no memory consumption is constant, and so on. And once you run the proxy, you just use the proxy uh, as if it was um, a GraphDB server directly. And you can find more about the proxy in the documentation. Uh, so uh, now the question is if there was if there is a total replication of all the data on all nodes yes uh, every node contains uh, a whole copy of the data and um, whenever a write happens in the cluster uh, the raft consensus algorithm requires that um, the majority of nodes agreed about the write before uh, we can confirm back to the client that the write is successful so in in a cluster of five nodes, as is ours here, it means that if the write initiated here on the leader, then at least two of the other nodes must agree about this write before we can say to the client that this write is successful. This way, um, the raft consensus algorithm guarantees that uh, if a node dies at some point, the data is still there and it won't get lost. Uh, okay, let me see if there are more questions. Uh, there is a question about uh, automating deployments of GraphDB. Uh, there is a Helm chart that can help you uh, deploy a cluster, um, so it's possible. Uh, there is a question about the parallelization in the GraphPath search. And that's a topic I didn't cover just because I wanted to focus uh, on some of the other changes in GraphDB 10, uh, but I couldn't cover all of the changes in GraphDB 10. So um, the GraphPath search now has a parallel mode. You can read about that in the documentation and hopefully we might uh, um, create a separate event about that. Um, there is a question about onto refine being removed from GraphDB 10. Uh, that's true. Um, onto refine will be developed as a separate product that is still going to be free to use. So uh, you just have to install it separately from GraphDB. So the first version isn't out yet. So if you um, need to use onto refine, uh, I suggest you just wait a bit more. We expect it to be released uh, in about a week. So you can continue using um, onto refining GraphDB 9. And after that, uh, you can simply copy your data directory from the refine uh, that was integrated with GraphDB 9 into uh, the separate onto refine product in order to upgrade. Uh, so, another question is uh, about using um, GraphDB uh, uh, through the REST API in Python. So, in Python, you don't have uh, this client API that we um, created in Java. So, in order to um, use the cluster in a in the most efficient way, uh, you need to use the external proxy that will protect from uh, an individual node failing. Because if you don't use the proxy and you simply point your client to say GraphDB1 and then GraphDB1 dies for some reason, 
uh, you have to reconfigure the client. So that's why we recommend using the proxy in such cases. But we are also considering developing um, our own client for Python and maybe for other languages. So um, that was the last question. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, the data and the queries that I used today, uh, you're going to get as part of the, together with the recording of the webinar, so you can try those things yourself. Thank you, Pavka. It was a very interesting demonstration. And mm -hmm. thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, like uh, Pavel just mentioned, you will receive the recording tomorrow alongside uh, the queries. Uh, thank you again for the excellent presentation and demonstration and for attending. So have a nice day or evening, depending on where you are. And see you next time. Thank you too. Bye.